So, what is, what is spirituality? Or what is theology of spirituality? Those are already a two tiny bit different things. You could say that spirituality is the thing itself, how we live as children of God in relationship to our Heavenly Father, as, as members of Christ's body and so on, how we practice our faith. And then theology of spirituality is study, which goes with this. It can be two things, at least two things. It could be simply how oftentimes theology is done today in academia, it can simply be study of other people, how they do it. You could say that the, the research or study of, of, of Christian spirituality is, is just studying how do Christians do stuff. But in the seminary, we want to go beyond simply describing what other people do. And you, like in church as well, it's not enough to simply say what somebody somewhere thought. We want to go forward and say, this is how it goes. This is what is good. This is what we don't believe. So in that sense, you could say that theology of the spirituality is uh, its not altogether different from catechetics or dogmatics or systematic theology or the doctrine of the church, but it's maybe it's that looked from a different angle of what do we believe and how does that affect the way we live our spiritual life as Christians. How do we pray? Prayer always has a content. Uh, what do we believe about the, the God to whom we are praying? All of these questions are, are on one hand, they are very dogmatic questions. And on the other hand, they are very important to us also on an individual and intimate spiritual level. So the theology of spirituality, or theology of Lutheran spirituality in this case, we try to do both of these things. That we do study the matters at hand, what, what, do the, what does the church teach about these things, what does the uh, Bible reveal about these things, but we do this with the intent that through this we gain insight, perhaps inspiration, desire in our spiritual life. So let's keep that as a, as a sort of a methodological thought. Uh, along with us as we study. So I'll pass now the lecture notes for this first class, which is titled, Look at the birds of the air, seeing the sanctity of creation and finding God hidden in the ordinary. So we will be talking about uh, creation, the first article of creative, as it's often called. I think I... So we'll engage this topic then through five five topic subtopics. First, the Christian story of creation versus pagan myths. Secondly, creation as a gift of God. Thirdly, call to work in creation. Fourthly, we talk about creation and salvation, our salvation and also the salvation of the creation. And then fifthly, creation and the prefigure of joy. And after this, I do hope I will end up in a point where we have nicely 10 minutes time and I will ask you of how do you think everything we have said this far could be beneficial in your spiritual life or anybody's spiritual life, you know? You don't have to share too much about your own life if you don't feel like it. It's always possible to just say that somebody somewhere might think this way. I have a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I would never be bothered by this, but I have this friend. Right. I know this one. Uh, I'm talking about Harvey. Right. The rabbit. I remember. Harvey the rabbit. Okay, Christian story of creation versus pagan myths. When I say Christian story of creation, I don't mean that the creation, as is told in, in the Genesis, is just a story, like a fairy tale. That's not my, my, my intention. My point is I'm going to ask it all the time. Right. No, I do think it's a, it's a real, real true event. Uh, but it's also told, in some sense, as a story, in a narrative fashion. It, it, 
it has an ending, it started an ending, it, it describes something that takes place, and afterwards you can look back at it and think, wow, that was something. And then there's pagan myths. Almost all religions have some sort of an explanation of how did all of this come to be. And what I discovered when I'm not, you know, um, I'm not a cultural or religious anthropologist who goes around the world studying obscure manuscripts. Any one of you who spends a day doing this could just learn the same stuff. But it's pretty interesting that there's so many similarities between different non-Christian myths, non-Christian narratives of how the world came to be. Uh, I did look at, well, you know, the Finnish stuff I know, uh, Finnish paganism back in the day. I looked at Vikings, the Greeks, and the, I guess you could say Mesopotamians, you know, the Babylonians. And there's so many things which are very common to all of these, and also things which are so very different from Christian story of creation, or Ju Judeo-Christian, you say, of course, Jews have the same. Which, which really leads one to wonder how it is. You, you sometimes hear it said. Sorry. You better be. No, well, welcome. I'm a farmer, okay? Who no excuses? I'm, I'm sorry. That's fine, fine, right? I'll be just taking everything you say, so. Uh, we did run out of coffee, so that serves you right for being late. But maybe you can sit sit next to someone, some charitable soul who lets you. Okay, so we were just talking about pagan, pagan myths about how creation happened, and now comparing them with, with Christian uh, understanding or Judeo-Christian understanding of creation. So, uh, some of the common themes to the pagan myths, uh, or to all of the pagan myths are, and I listed here some. Uh, the world as we know it now is created only at the end of the story. Usually it doesn't, doesn't have the idea that, bam, the world comes to be, and this is the world. But rather that there is this sort of a phase where all sorts of things happen, and there's you know, battles, and, and heroes come, and everything. And only at the end of the story, we get to this world, as it is now. So, so that's, that was quite a common theme. Usually in the beginning there is chaos, some sort of chaos, often in the form of water, or water and fire. So, so the, and then gradually over that, over the, over the story, uh, the world as we know it comes forth. Uh, the beginning of all things is left vague. That's something, you know, if you want to really know where, where did everything come from, these pagan myths don't really answer the question. It starts with something already being there. There's always this sort of big mass of water or, or, or water and, and lava or some sort of thing. And you never get explanation of where did that come from. So the beginning of all things is left vague. From this original chaos usually somehow emerges the first god or goddess or both. In the Viking legends it is Ymir the giant. In the Babylonian Enuma Elish, it's the god Apsu of sweet water and goddess Tiamat of salt water. The, the, the original waters separate. In Greek myth, Gaia, the earth mother, simply emerges, etc. So you start with no gods. The very beginning of the story, there is no god. There is no gods. There is just chaos. And out of chaos, somehow, a god or a goddess or both emerge. Um, but there is no explanation of how they come to be. It's not explained where did they come, they just appear. Oftentimes in this story there is also... Sorry Richard, do you have a question? Well, when you talk about the chaos, assuming, let's, let's say we agree with them, um, where did the chaos come from? Well, I don't know. That's, that, that's one of the things that always uh, I always end up discussing with people. They keep saying about it happened like that. But where did that come from that it could happen like that? Yeah, that's, e that's exactly... the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's true. And that is, is the sort of a 
puzzling thing with this is that it doesn't answer the question that there is a chaos which is just coming from somewhere. Uh, there is what's often called theogony, that's a fancy word, for the birth of gods. Uh, like in the, in the Babylonian story, um, the Apsu and um, Tiamat, you know, god and goddess, give birth to a number of gods who then rebel against them. Or in Ymir the giant, in, out of his forehead, somehow grow other gods. Uh, you know, it's, it's weird, it's really weird stuff. But, but somehow there is this theogony that gods come to be, and they often, they, they procreate like human beings, that male gods and female goddesses get together and, and give birth to new gods. And there is this sort of a, a group of, original group of gods emerges. Often in these, these stories, some sort of battle takes place, where the new gods rise against the old gods. In the, in the Babylonian legend, it's that the prime two gods, a god and goddess, give birth to the number of gods who then conspire against them and kill them. Uh, Umir's, from Umir's head come, come, other, come gods who kill Umir. Um, was it Zeus? No. Kronos, who was eating his children then. Oh, I don't remember exactly the details, but in the Greek legend, there is also a similar kind of battle. That's very common, that there is a battle, and it always ends up with new gods defeating the old gods. The new ones kill the, the original god who created everything. Um, often body parts of the ancient gods are used to create the world as we know it, that's interesting little fact. And creation of humans comes at the very end of the story. And it almost happens by accident, or at least there is no great sense of importance anymore. You could say, after everything is said and done, by the way, let's make some humans as well now that we're at it. You don't get the feeling that this was somehow a culmination point of the story. It's just at the very end, you know, you're not exactly hungry anymore, but you can still have one cappuccino. So, the main thing is done already, but why not? Why not have a couple of humans as well? From a Christian observer, we see some very clear differences, and very important differences, when you compare the, the pagan myths with what we read from Genesis 1 to 3. In pagan myths, like I said, the, the story begins with the world already somehow being in place, although in a state of chaos, and the original gods arise out of the world itself. So they are part of the, crea uh, the, they are part of the world, actually. In Christian understanding of creation, God creates the world out of nothing. It's called ex nihilo, out of nothingness. God is not part of the world, nor does he arise from it, but rather he exists before the world is created, and he gives existence to the world. In pagan myths, the gods the people worship, whether they are Odin or Zeus, they are usually not the same gods who created the world. They are part of the world. In Christianity, we worship the same God who also created the heavens and earth. There is not like a, like a second class of gods who is more close to us we worship, but rather the same God we worship is also the, the, the Ur God, the, the, the first God. Um, in pagan myths, the world and gods are born without any real, or plan, real plan or purpose. They come by accident. Whereas in Genesis, God is acting with a clear will and desire to create. He says, let there be. The fact that God speaks during his creation not only shows the importance of God's word in creation, which is also there, but it also shows the intentionality of creation. Nothing in creation, uh, as, as Bible tells it, happens by accident. It always happens because God wills it to happen and he plans it to happen. Whereas in pagan myths, it seems like it's one, you know, one crazy chaos, you know, the gods come along and it still keeps on being chaos. And, and stuff just happens and nobody is really running the show. In pagan myths, a strife exists between the new gods and the arch god. And new gods always win. In Genesis, the serpent rebels against God, sure. And he leads people to rebel as well, sure. However, they do not succeed. In that sense, 
Uh, Genesis also includes a rebellion taking place, but it doesn't succeed. God cannot be pushed out of power by his creatures, unlike the, the pagan myths. Which, of course, if, you're, if you want to think it like that, you could say that, you know, that the pagan mythology tells the story from the devil's perspective, you know. He's the way, that's the way things should have been. The new gods come and push the old ones up. Well, I don't know. Uh, as said, in pagan myths, not much attention is given to the creation of humans. Uh, these myths glorify uh, the ancient gods, or ancient works of the gods, so that people can fear and worship them. Whereas in Genesis, the creation of humans is the pinnacle of the whole story. Genesis shows that humans are at the very center of God's plan for the world. This is really what strikes you very different when you read Genesis 1 to 3 compared to how the, the pagan myths go. That, that, like, God devotes, God's word devotes a whole chapter, this whole second chapter of Genesis, simply to the fact that there's Adam who doesn't have a companion, and we need to find Eve for him. Uh, so, the, so, of course, you know, you create light and, 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 the, and the heavens and sun and the moon, and that's also there. But it's actually not so taking so much space compared to the creation of man, which is really a big thing. Sorry, Rolf, you had a question? Well, I just, when, when you, first when we say that there's, a, there's an attempt to, to, uh, to show that God is not the, uh, in control all the time and, and all powerful, when these, when these little, when the devil comes in and does this little thing, then it, initially it appears that if the de as of the, the devil wins. But we know, of course, that in the end, he doesn't. That God is always successful because he planned everything that happened. Yeah, and maybe there is that some, some sort of feeling there that, you know, these myths also try to explain why things don't go the way the priests say they ought to go. And interesting when you say that... Uh, Adam was alone, and so he had to find Eve. It, it's that it wasn't man's idea that came to God and said, I need a helper. Right. But it was God's. He saw that it, wasn't, it is not good for man to be alone. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, get him a helper. Right. And that's, that brings to the last point I want to raise up is that in pagan myths, when there is creation of humans, you mention us as there is, sometimes there are also these tales of, of the, what happened in the very beginning. And they can be of the nature that, you know, how fire was discovered, or who made the first uh, city, or, or, or who, who sowed the first field. Uh, some sort of heroic deeds, or some, some, some great warrior. Uh, marriage is assumed, but usually not even mentioned in the myths. Whereas in Genesis, they don't tell anything about what Adam and Eve did in the paradise, except that they got together. There's no, you know, story about the great feats of exploration Adam perhaps did, or, or whatever they did. That's completely unnecessary to re re recollect there. They only tell one thing. How marriage came to be. Because that's what the myth always tries to explain. Myth always tries to explain to people today how did things come to be the way we see them being right now. And you know, if, you if you're a king, you would like there to be a myth which tells how did your family line get their power from some gods or deities and explains why it is so that we must rule this country. And a myth always tries to explain how did things come to be the way they are right now. And Genesis tells only one thing. Where did marriage come from? How did men and women get together? So we can see that they don't tell anything else, but that shows the, the value of marriage in, in God's plan. Okay, again, very different from, from other myths. I mean, discovering fire is also great, but... But, but this is what God's word tells us. To put it briefly then, the message of Genesis, which becomes even more clear when compared to other myths people have told about creation, is that the world is not eternal, 
but it indeed was created by God, and that this God was and still is in complete control of his creation. That this creation is made with will and design, and it is God-pleasing, it pleases God. And the most central part of creation is humanity. And among all human activities, extra attention is given to the love between husband and wife. Now, if you, if you just take that nutshell of what, what Christian story of creation tells, you know, it highlights some things. It could tell many other things, but it chooses to highlight a few things. And you compare it to the pagan myths, but also you compare it to modern pagan myths we tell, or, or we don't tell, but people tell these days. You can see that uh, there is a lot of similarity, actually, with the paganism of the old times and the paganism of today. And again, Christianity is in very stark opposition to the paganism of old and, of old and new. Uh, we see how the worldviews of today are challenging every aspect of Christian faith in creation. And I, I like to point out we are not talking about simply the question about evolution theory versus uh, creationism or, or cre creation. But we are talking about, in some sense, even, even much more serious and, and uh, events which go to the very core of what do we believe about the purpose of creation. I mean, oftentimes the, the question we get bogged down with is simply of how did everything happen, which is also a worthy question to ask. But, but then comes the question of why did everything happen? Was there any kind of a plan or purpose for this? And, and this is also where, where there exists a great difference. As we see now, the postmodern view of creation follows many of the pagan notions. For, for example, there is no purpose or plan for the world. There is, the, the, the God did not create anything, but rather he was created himself also. You could say by the imagination of, of human worshippers, we could say today, you know, people created gods, not the other way around. Uh, humans exist almost by accidents. We just happen to be. We don't, we wouldn't need to be, but we just are. And their purpose is not viewed through family, marriage, and love between husband and wife. You know, paganism going on, strong. The need for Christians to see the uniqueness of our faith and to turn away from paganism is, again, very real. All right. Let's look at the second aspect then. Richard, go ahead. When you go through all of this, one thing that sticks out to me is that how all these myths are an attempt to rationalize God or a God. And then the inventions that we come up with are all these myths. Okay, so I guess in one way it must be Satan working at that, trying to disillusion a lot of people to believe differently than what God actually created. Mm. The reason that people all have similar uh, versions of it is that God has planned it. They, they all know God. It's just a question of where their faith is. Yeah, and I think many times it's also, these are very human myths in the sense yeah. that the, uh, you could say that the human realities are then projected back into the creation myths. That, that the way we see human societies working, you know, chaos and, and struggles between factions, those just get, get thrown into the creation myth and they become sort of a religion. Okay. Let's go into a little bit lighter topics, maybe, or maybe a spiritually nourishing topic of creation as, as gift. We leave now behind ourselves the, the pagan myths and, and go, go into our Christian faith. Uh, creation, as, uh, can, creation can be thought of as a historical fact, which it certainly is. But the topic of creation does go much further also than just history. Creation is an ever-present and deeply personal reality for each human being. Martin Luther describes this well 
he, when he writes a small catechism about the first article of creation. I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my limbs, my reason and all my senses, and still preserves them. In addition thereto, clothing and shoes, meat and drink, house and homestead, wife and children, fields, cattle, and all my goods, that he provides me richly and daily with all that I need to support this body and life, protects me from all danger, and guards me and preserves me from all evil, and all this out of pure fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me, for all which I owe it to, thank, to him to thank, praise, and serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. When the topic of creation is discussed, and the marvels of God's works are discussed, often the focus uh, goes out into the vast galaxies, and the grandeur of design in the entire universe, and the ecological wonders of our planet. You know, mountain ranges, and, and bald eagles, and, and blue whales, and you know, tides and tectonic moves, and, and, and Milky Way, and black holes, and all of that makes you your head spin, and, and then you just end up saying that God is, you know, really great, that he can create that and keep all of that somehow going together. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but Luther has a quite different viewpoint. Instead of wonders of the creation out there, he focuses on speaking of the creation work in me and for me. Uh, it's not true, of course, that Luther didn't know about galaxies, but even those things he well knew about, sun, moon, stars, etc., are not mentioned, even though you could, you know, dazzle uh, a peasant's imagination by speaking about them. Rather, the li list of examples given is almost vulgar in how down to earth and concrete it is. Eyes, ears, shoes, meat, cattle, etc. God has created cows. Why take examples of this nature? Why does Luther give this sort of a list uh, of things when he tries to explain, you know, give some concrete of what God has created? Now, perhaps one reason is simply to work with the kind of imagery the reader would be familiar with. Sure enough, he takes examples from the daily life of a German peasant in the 16th century. A more important reason, and also, might also point to a common spiritual truth. And this is what I've figured out. It is easy to believe things in abstract thought, and harder to believe them in concrete life. Taking fields, cattle, and all my goods as examples of God's creation may make the article of creation easier to understand, sure, but it also brings to focus things where this faith is hardest to keep. A German peasant of the 16th century would not have had much trouble believing that the sun is made, sustained, and governed by God. I mean, it's it's sun, it's radiant, it's glorious, it's crazy big and, and wonderful. That must be done by God. However, believing that his harvest and the welfare of his cow was just as well governed and sustained by God would be more difficult. You know, is Bessie going to make it or not? That's in God's hands. <clears throat> and you could say that on a daily level, <clears throat> where the temptations and despair strike you. It's not that you're awfully worried about what's going to happen to the sun tomorrow, if it's going to rise or not. It's not a concern you carry. But you might be awfully worried about your harvest, if you're a farmer, or if you're a factory worker, you're worried about the layouts they are doing, and if you're going to lose your job, or if you have an elderly parent, you're worried about if they're going to be losing their limbs and ears and, and eyes and, and everything. That's the kind of stuff we are, we are, you know, thinking when we wake up in the night. And that's why, I think that's why Luther wants to take examples which are so mundane, so down to earth, so everyday, because he knows that it's in these things where the fears come and the worries come, that, that we will lose these things or God somehow fails to take care of us in these things. 
Have you thought about the understanding of, of things, how they work? Sorry, Are Richard? you talking about understanding how things work? Like, for instance, if someone dies or someone, an animal dies or whatever? No, I'm, th I'm speaking more about that, <clears throat> about whether God is going to be taking care of you in these things. That I think these are the things where, if we are afraid of things, they are mostly about things which have something to do with our daily lives. We are not so worried about things which are far away from us, even if they are great and magnificent. We kind of leave those very easily to God to handle. But it is these very down-to-earth things that, that... I think if you, if you totally trust God, you don't have to be afraid. I think the fear comes from the other side. Mm -hmm. Richard, I, I agree with you completely there. If you trust God completely, yeah. but of course we don't always trust God. Well, no, we, that's where doubt comes in and makes us human, right? Yeah, and that's where the, where the strengthening then needs to come as well. When, when, when we strengthen our faith or when we strengthen our weak hearts, it points to those things where we are already, you know, wobbly. Well, but the, uh, the, the one... Well, in early Christian, in people's lives, I think, is the statement that uh, in addition there to clothing and shoes, meat and drink, house and homestead, then a person would say, no, just a minute, God didn't give you my shoes, I had to buy them, mm -hmm. or I had to make them myself, mm -hmm. he didn't give it to me, so on, this is the way, how do we get the people to accept that, yes, God uh, God made it possible that I have shoes. That's true as well. Because and that's... of, you know, that he supports me in, in, in all the other ways that make possible that I can earn a living, buy a house and a car and, and all these things, and clothing. That's right. So this is also that, that we might, again, we might accept that God made the universe, but but my house was built by me. Yeah, exactly. You know, God, you God, God is pretty... Ability, you know, yeah, I know, that. I know, Richard, that's, that's how it goes, but this is how we often think, that God is pretty good at making universes, but at least I can make houses. <laughs> so, but, but that then rolls like we say, that, that also puts your finger on that, that you, you must confess that this also is God's gift. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, too, Martin, I mean, in the 16th century, they didn't, they only knew God before, sort of, what the Roman Catholic Church told them that God wanted you to be good and do good deeds and like they they were mm -hmm. fearful of God so they wouldn't have probably attributed God to good things that happened in their lives. Yeah, or or maybe you could, but you would also be fear fearful that he might pull pull his favors back. Yeah. And then this is <clears throat> okay. I was gonna make a point that um, in some ways it kind of nullified like our age, we do worry about big questions about things mm -hmm. like evolution and uh, science has come a long way in explaining sort of the way things are. You didn't mention the tectonic movements and continents coming together and stuff like that. Climate change? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, like where they might have been sort of concerned about shoes and my shoes, where my shoes come from and God actually making the shoes. We are sort of worried about where do the continents come from? Where did life come from? Uh, in the same way that, like Luther's argument, kind of nullifies those questions and says that God did make your shoes. Yeah. So the same way we don't have to. It's it's in our age where we worry about things like evolution and tectonic plates. It kind of nullifies all of that. As in, with tectonic plates made the continents, we can never stand with God. We're all of that together. Right. And that's, that's probably a thing where we have to, and I encourage you guys to, I mean, it, let's say we very easily, we, we go into soaring heights of, of intellect, you know, and, and we might not be so honest with ourselves there, that we, we, we think that we ought to be worried about climate change when we are actually more worried about our next paycheck. And that's fine, that's how we humans are. But if we do actually think about climate change or tectonic phase or whatever, I think this is a point where, I mean, Luther's list is just one list, and 
I think it's, it's an encouragement for any, any 21st century Christian who is not a peasant and who doesn't own a cow, and even if he owned a cow, he wouldn't know what to do with it, uh, to think about, well, let's make a list for my life. You know, if, if, if I, would, I don't have a field, I don't have a car, what do I have? I have a car, it's breaking down all the time and it's costing me money. Uh, and, and, you know, I have, I have a, a job in a factory and, and we might lose it because, you know, there's no future for industry. And that kind of thing that you can, you can fill this with whatever is in our context, in your context, is, is the most pressing, uh, where your worries are and, and where God's providence also is shown to you. Sorry, I think we have to go a little bit further. <laughs> There's still many things to come up. Uh, and, and kind of Rolf already mentioned that, uh, that question about, well, where did my shoes come from? And who built my house? Uh, and, 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 and that kind of points us to the topic we call vocation. But we, we get into that a little bit later. Um, yeah. God provides me richly and daily with all that I need to support this body and life, protects me from all danger and guards me and preserves me from all evil. A creation of, uh, or article of creation is first and foremost characterized by its gift nature. Confessing God as my creator means confessing him as the one who gives gifts. So there is uh, uh, like a giving taking place in creation uh, and it's a, it's a constant um, in this sense, the article of creation is very much in line with what Luther said about the first commandment in large catechism, where God says, you shall have no other gods. And Luther, I think it's a very brilliant move from him. He says, or he asks, what is a god to anybody? And, and his answer was that a god is that from which you expect all good things and to which you put your hope in every every trial and, and, and danger. So and, and then in the first article <coughs> then we kind of see, well, our God is the God who has given you eyes and ears and, and who continues to do that. So therefore you can and you should consider him to be your God. That because he is a good God and from him you can expect all good things and to him you can flee in all Times of danger and, and, and trial, and he continues to do this. While thankfulness can sometimes be used as a weapon against a suffering person, it can nonetheless be a magnificent source of strength and spiritual joy if understood rightly. To plead to God and to ask Him to give this or that is certainly not wrong at all. Yet at the same time. Uh, for one's own sake, it would be good to stop and me meditate on the gifts God has given and continues to give. At the very least, the life itself and our bodies, even in their frailties and weaknesses, are still wonderful gifts of God. It's kind of like if you would, if, if Luther says that your eyes are a gift of God, and your ears are a gift of God, and all your limbs are gifts of God, like. How many of us wake up in the morning and open your eyes and say, Oh, wonderful, thank you, God, that I have eyes. Well, we don't do that because we get used to it. But if we would, and if we would give thanks to all these things we experience, that would be a wonderful life to lead. You know, it would be life filled with thankfulness and joy. Of course, that's not how we do. We, we get used to these things. Like a, a child gets used to its new bicycle and, you know, the the great joy of riding a bike is gone in a few weeks, and something else comes along. But it's, it's something maybe to, to pursue and, and think of. It's not very practical, though. If we give him thanks for all the things we should thank him for every morning, then by the time it's, we are done with this, and half the day is gone. I'd be late for work. <laughs> yeah, which is also you make that gift of God. You, you should wake up early. And I don't. In the small catechism description of creation, Luther interestingly, interestingly brings in language normally used in the article of justification. And Luther writes, all this he does out of pure fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit 
for worthiness in me. Now the words um, mercy, merit, and worthiness, these are the kind of words we normally use when we speak about forgiveness of sins, or, or who is worthy to, to receive the sacrament or how we don't get any merit in, in, the, in the eyes of God for doing this or that. But Luther borrows that kind of terms from, from justification and brings them into the uh, uh, topic of creation, showing that God acts as a merciful, generous and kind Father, not only in the redemption achieved by Christ, which of course is of the utmost importance, but already in the creation and sustaining the world. Every good thing we enjoy is a gift from God, and at the same time a reminder of His love. Ever since the 17th century, there has been a thing uh, among Christian church called deism. Uh, and deism, while never denying the existence of God or His original act of creation, thought that at the present God is no longer actively taking part in the world. Often they had a comparison of God as a clockmaker, who very carefully makes the machinery and winds the clock and lets it tick after that. Tick, 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 tick. And, and the clockmaker doesn't need to active, actively participate in the clock anymore after that. So that was kind of the vision. Uh, God, would, uh, God would be the power that starts off the world but this, then distances himself from it. And many Christians are practically deists, not by choice, but simply out of weakness of faith. We think that God surely has created everything, but we forget the fact that he has created me and he continues to uh, keep me up and he daily and richly provides me. Like Luther says, he daily provides me things. It's not that he once did it and then, you know, go ahead and do what you want with your life, make it work. But he's constantly present in human life. Uh, it's, it's quite opposite. What, uh, today is in what St. Paul wrote when he says of God in Acts 17, He is actually not far from each of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. Like God surrounds us almost. God's continual creation means also God's continual presence in His creation. And here one has to be careful not to say too much while still saying enough. Christians do not believe in pantheism, where the world itself would be somehow divine, and the nature would be uh, God in itself. But we do believe that God is actively present in his creation as its sustainer. It's really wonderful to read Job 39 onwards, the end of Job, when God shows up and, and puts Job against the wall. And the example God gives are from the natural world. You know, he asks Job, have you uh, given birth to some deers? What do they have? Fawns? Fawns? Yeah. yeah. Maybe deer. Or, or do you know where I keep uh, snow and hay? As, you know, as if you, you have this image that God has a room somewhere which is full of snow, and then he goes there with a bucket, and then when the snow is needed, he throws it down. Of course, it's an it's a, it's a image which probably he doesn't have the sort of a room. If he does, that's cool. Uh, but but that's, how it's, that's how it's described. That God is behind snow. When it snows, it snows because God made it snow. When baby, when baby deer are born, it's because God was acting as the midwife. Uh, when leaves come in the spring, God lets them come. When, when, the, when the storm comes, it comes because God allowed it to come. When the sun, sun rises up, God calls it up. That sun, now it's time to get up. You know, ding, ding, ding up. And, and it's like God is actively at work in everything that happens. Uh, and, and you don't, it's kind of like this is, this is the point where I say that we don't say too much, but we don't say too little either. We don't say that God, that nature is God. But you could say that nature is full of God all the time, actively, busily doing things. And that's, that's wonderful. This reality, gives, this reality gives one more gift, which Luther didn't mention, because he probably wasn't struggling with it. But our age is, you call this alienation, I think, it's some, the fancy word for it. 
the, the, there's lo loss of meaning. The sense of meaning is gone. And, and this is one gift the article of creation gives. <laughs> Unlike pagan myths, we believe that everything that exists, exists because God wanted it to exist, and by his work it comes into being. It means that the entire creation bears the handprint of God, constantly moving and acting under his care, and is filled with his thought and purpose. Although even now creation is marred by the fall in many ways, at its core it is full of God-pleasing things, full of meaning and purpose. So, so the whole world of nature and creation it is full of God's activity. And, and that can open new horizons and new thoughts of, of what's the meaning of life and what's my meaning here on earth. And, and that there is, you know, to use a little bit like a you know, fantasy language, there's a magical world out there. And, and, and experience it and, and be amazed by it. It's not mundane. It's not boring. It, it's full of wonder. Because it's full of God's work. Call to work in creation. Luther's explanation of the creation in the small catechism ends with the statement, For all which I owe it to, to him to thank, praise, serve, and obey him. The service of God, we re or the service we render to God, doesn't take us away from his creation, but take us back inside his work of creation. Creation is first a gift, but then also a calling. Practically many of the everyday blessings of creation come to us from God, but through other people's work. In, similar, in a similar manner, as Paul describes the government as being the servant of God, all human work ultimately is meant to serve God by serving others. Clothes and shoes do not fall from heaven on their own, they need tailors and shoemakers. Bread comes from bakeries, etc. Luther certainly knew this, but still confessed that all these things are given by God. In the same way we know, at least some of the, purposes, the processes that, that cause weather, but still a Christian farmer, even today, expects rain to come from God. While we may not see God in creation, through faith we recognize his work. Luther sometimes used the language of, of masks of God to describe humans laboring for these things. We see the person working, but behind him, God himself is in action. The human worker being a mask that hides the still very active God. So when Luther said something like, a, a plowboy or a milkmaid is doing a holy service to Lord, uh, he didn't simply mean to promote some sort of social equality, that, you know, let's take these less valued professions and elevate them a little bit. No, Luther goes much deeper than that. As Colossians 3 puts it, and Paul is talking to slaves there, whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. It is through the labor of shoemakers and tailors that the Lord gives the creation gift of shoes and clothing. God wants everyone to have shoes, so he gives shoemakers. And shoemakers get leather from someone, and, and so on. Uh, and, and the one working, one, uh, any, anyone working in a profession or any profession which aims to benefit the neighbor works with God and for God. And the idea that there would be such a thing as secular vocation is therefore not possible. Even a secular vocation is very deeply spiritual vocation because it is God's tool for making something in this world. Prof. All this, I guess, falls into our stewardship of God's gifts. Yes. It's all part of what we do. Yeah, also or, called or vocation. Do. Yeah. It's all part of that. Yeah. And when we, when we look at uh, the concern today, climate change, that demonstrates, I guess, what we do wrong mm -hmm. in his creation. That's that's very true. It, it calling really brings a, a, a lots of meaning, but also responsibility. 
to, to vocation, whatever one's vocation might be. Anyone who serves their neighbor is doing God's work. And, and this goes well beyond employment. I think we, we often simplify vocation too much by always talking about employment. There's so many other vocations as well, in the family or in the, in the civil realm of citizens or also in the church, any kinds of vocations there. Uh, again, Christians are confronted with the fact that everything they do is somehow meaningful. There are no aspects in our life or segments in our life which would be outside of God's creation or outside of God. We cannot claim any area of our life as our own autonomous area where we get to do what we want and God has no say there. You know, it's like you have this this, this very sad cases of, of men having man caves in their houses as if there would be one room where the wife can't come and all the other rooms are then the wife's own rooms. You know, that's a... I have a strong opinion about that. I think it's very bad. But, well, no, but a, man, we, a man cave is that uh, your, your wife allows you to have a separate place so you don't make a mess that she has to Yeah, we keep you too. That's right. Okay, I guess this might be some, some practical wisdom. Richard, do you have a man cave? No. <laughs> but the idea, that, the idea that you would have this sort of a man cave in your life, some things or areas in your life where you would be alone, responsible for things, and God doesn't have any say there. That's, that's ludicrous. That's not Christianity. And likewise, you don't have to fear that there is any area of your life where God isn't with you. That he somehow, you know, he meets you in the church and that's when you have, you know, communion and you spend quality time together, but then it's back to your normal life again and you don't know how you're going to manage. No, it's, it's God is present in every aspect of your life. <clears throat> one way to serve God, and this is one thing we often don't talk about so much, one way to serve God is through art and creativity. Uh, following Jesus' statement, the son does what he sees father doing from John 5, maybe with that we can understand that God's calling in creation also includes the use of will, talent and craft to create. Truly created in the image of God, humans have amazing capability for imagination and artistic expression. To speak of things which do not exist as if they would exist, and in so doing, making them in some sense real. I was thinking about literary characters when I was doing this. We speak of literary characters as if they were real people sometimes, like you, you, you James say Bond. Hamlet or J James Bond, James Bond, <laughs> or 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 Bilbo Baggins, or or you know a, a, a character. Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk. He was real. <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe he will be. In 200 years. And now, of course, you can get too much lost in that. Well, you know, well, Harry Potter is, is more real than your siblings, I guess. But, but there is something interesting in the way stories which people make up from their imaginations, they become very real feeling things. The good ones, the ones that people read and talk about. Uh, and, and that's interesting. Um, there is something in, in art and, and, and what we do, we, we don't create in the same sense as God creates, of course. But we do create in, in some other sense, in some minor sense, we create something there. Uh, 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 and and is, Tolkien, is, yeah. Is create really the real word? word? The right word for that, because created create means making of something out of nothing. We're using something to make something to portray something. So we're actually using what's God already given us, not that we create something like you're saying. It, you know, the, it isn't a creation that we make. Yeah, I don't know what would be. I, I don't know it for it. I, it's it's more like making out of what out of what God gave us. Yeah, crafting. But how do you understand creation and the creating that we do? in that aspect, not that, like I don't like that word create, that man creates, man doesn't create, it's already been created, right. we just start to use it and explore it, like God said, we, we can do all things. Tolkien, the writer of the, of the Lord of the Rings, he spoke of, of the term sub-creator, 
Uh, and with that, he meant that that God is the creator. God is the one who creates. A man is a sub-creator, like a like a one step below. You know, you might shake your head. No. You don't like the term, but but let's allow people to try come up with some terms. <laughs> Subcontractor. <laughs> like something that that is not the same thing as God, but it's something a little bit in the same direction. That you create into being something which wasn't there before. You you create a character who is not a real human being, but he wasn't there before. So so that's interesting. Or you create art or music or or architecture or or some, something like the ballet, and and you do something which which is also part of creation, and it, it amazes and it produces joy, and it can you know leave other people you know, happy and other people sad and, and, and everything. And to some people it can even even like give them some spiritual joy. It's like good, good Bach thing or something like that. Um, and that's, I think, when we speak in, in this Luther categories of, of house and shoes and stuff like that, there's one more I want to add there, which is to make beautiful houses and good looking shoes and really good tasting meat. That there is something in, in, in creation which goes beyond simply saying that, you know, you have this stuff so that you don't die. God goes beyond that. God goes beyond simply keeping you alive just barely. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the wedding feast in Cana, and, and then, you know, Jesus makes excellent wine. You know, he didn't have to do it so good, but, you know... When you're son of God, I guess you can't you can't do mediocre things, and and God wants things to be to be beautiful. Uh, it, the, the Hebrew word tov, uh, which the, the the Genesis constantly uses when it says God saw and it was good. God saw you know the animals and he he saw it was good. Or God looked at everything and, and said it was good. The word is tov, and it's funny that the same word means good. Like morally good, beautiful, and functional. You know, a thing which which does what it's supposed to do, like a sharp knife, is beautiful, and, and it's tall. It, it's it's great. The Hebrews have one word which translates as all of these things, and maybe there's a little bit of wisdom there. That that the beauty and and function and a moral goodness come kind of close to each other. The one word is perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So this is something I think as as theologians we we kind of we, we value arts often only in the sense that they serve uh, directly religious purposes. You know, if you have a painter who makes a very beautiful painting of Jesus, that might be great. Or if you have a composer who composes a a, a very beautiful church music piece with words which talk about Jesus, that's great. But I think we have to go beyond that and simply say that anybody who creates art, even if it's not about Jesus directly, if it's about trees or, or apples, you know, what, for some reason you have to paint fruit on the table, if you do it very beautifully, I think you are doing something God-pleasing. It's something you, you well, that's one kind of a vocation. That's one way of us serving our neighbor and serving God in doing that. You don't have to like it, not everybody likes it. But they really like the same kind of houses or the same kind of shoes. But, but some people like it. Okay, a couple of final points. Uh, creation and salvation. I think this is kind of where we, where we wrap things up. Creation is both the object, uh, object of God's saving work, but also the instrument through which he works. And this is... Now, this would be the point to play the kettle drum and, and play the trombones, but we don't have those. But, but the great, wonderful, and, and miraculous thing happens in the incarnation of Jesus. And it goes so much beyond simply the fact that, that Mary was a virgin and, and she had a child. It, it means that God, who is the creator of the world, and has always... <coughs> You know, that, that's, you know, that's one thing. Even if God is very active in the world, he's always been very clearly separate from the world. 
God is not the same as creation. Creation is definitely not the same as God. That's, that's kept, that distinction has been kept sharp. It's, 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 it's bigger than the, you know, the, the, the lords and ladies versus the, the staff in, in Downton Abbey. You know, you know, there's these boundaries you don't cross. But what happens in the incarnation of Jesus is that these boundaries cross. The Son of God becomes a human being. And, and there were some, some people back in the old church period, when this was hotly debated, who proposed that maybe Jesus brought from heaven his human body with him. Or some sort of a heavenly flesh. And that was very sternly rejected by the church. No, no, no. Jesus got his flesh from Mary. Jesus was born true human being out of a true human being. And he's still the son of God. And, and this is really a big mystery. And then when we say that in, in Christ there is no two Jesuses, there's no two Christs, but only one. He's not a split personality in that sense. So you can say that the son of God was born of a woman. The God was born of a woman. Which is very old way of putting it. A uh, very old Christian way of saying that that son that the God was born of a woman. My Mary is called uh, the the mother of God, which is not a Catholic, but it's very good Christian way of saying. Is the expression not assumed? Assumed the body. Yeah, he assumed the body, but he, he yeah. didn't take the body as if it was no, no, in, some sort of a you know wardrobe waiting for him. But, yeah, he became man. Yeah, he became man. And, and there, indeed, God becomes part of his creation in Christ Jesus. You know, we, we don't like pantheism, and we don't say that God is present in every daffodil and, and, you know, wave you have in the Lake Ontario and stuff. But in Christ Jesus, God becomes part of his creation. That there is a creature called Jesus of Nazareth, who has flesh and bones, and who sweats and, and, and goes to the toilet and eats fish with his, his fishermen friends, and... And he does all the human stuff and shapes if he, they didn't shape, but good shape. And he is also God. God shapes. God eats fish. God sleeps in the boat. God had to get his diapers changed when he was a baby. That's as robust as it comes. That's magnificent. And... And, and then, this also means that this God who became part of his creation, he redeems the creation. He redeems human race by becoming a human being. But even in a larger scale, he redeems the entire creation. Like the whole creation fell with Adam. You, God said, because of you, the, the earth shall be cursed. And, and, you know, the thorns and thistles, it shall grow. Elizabeth and I, we sometimes watch nature documentaries, and then there's some terribly ugly parasite that, you know, lays its eggs in somebody else's brain, or, or, or something like that. We just conclude that that is not part of God's original creation, that is part of the fall. And I do believe that. The, the nature is suffering under the curse of sin, but nature is also part of the great redemptive work Jesus has done. And therefore, Paul says uh, that the whole creation moans, waiting for the salvation which is, which is about to come. Uh, and and once, once the, the salvation comes in fullness when Jesus appears again, he, he doesn't you know, throw away the, the, the creation saying that it was nice to use you, but now we don't need you anymore because we're all going to sit on a cloud. No, he recreates, he heals and he restores, and, and, and he, God, when, he, when God saw the, the creation, he said it was very good, and God doesn't change his mind, he doesn't say that, you know, well, I had the face when I liked creation, but now I'm not so sure anymore, no, no, he sees the creation and he says it's very good, and it's worth saving. He doesn't say, we tried it, let's, let's do something else, but rather, in the New Jerusalem, there will be streets, and there will be water, 
and there will be trees, and there will be fruit, and there will be eating, and drinking, and probably music, and singing, and all sorts of things we have here on earth. But they will be purified and glorified and illuminated and, and in, the, in the wonderful form. So, so creation article, and also the redemption of creation, defends the Christian faith against unhealthy, sometimes we could call it Gnostic ideas, that, that God doesn't really care about you know, the, the world or the, or, the, or the material things, that he only is concerned about the mental and, and the intellectual, and only the heads and not the bodies. Uh, and this really guards us against that error. And even today, when we still wait for Christ to return, we are receiving the gifts of God through created beings, through created things. Um, the, the Augsburg Confession, Article 5, when they talk about the, how does the saving faith come to people, they use, in German, they use a very, very good word. I wonder if I remember it right, Elizabeth. Or, or maybe you can correct me, or anybody who's very good in German. There's many German speaking people here. Um, this is Leibliches or Leibliches? Leibliches? Yeah, that's one. Which means, directly translated, bodily word. Leib is a body. Leib. Leiblich. Bodily, like with this word, bodily word. They are speaking that the, that, the, that the Holy Spirit is given through sacraments and bodily word. Or the word and sacraments, and without this bodily word, we do not have the Holy Spirit. And I got interested, what do they mean with bodily word? It means simply this fact that we, we do not receive the word of God without created things. We do not receive the sacraments without the created things. Okay, sacraments, you kind of get it, you know, you have to have water, otherwise you don't have baptism. You have to have bread and wine, otherwise you don't have communion. But it goes beyond that. You have to have, if you want to read scripture, you have to have paper, ink. You, if you don't read it, but somebody proclaims to you, that's also a bodily act. You know, a, a pa every pastor who has preached a sermon knows that Preaching is physically exhausting stuff. I'm going to be exhausted after this class. And you are listening with your God-given ears, and I'm speaking with my God-given voice, and there's bodily act happening here. We sometimes miss that. We think that, that speaking or preaching is purely mental. No, it's not. That would be telepathy. We don't believe in telepathy. We, we, we speak, and you hear, and, and, and waves are going in the air. And word of God is, is communicated as vibrations of the air. <laughs> this gets you know, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit you know, we're in the zone now. <laughs> but I just want to underline it that there is no such thing as, as the God's saving activity which happens without creation being involved. His means of grace are thoroughly using the, the creation as a tool. Of course, it's never just creation in itself. It's never just bread. It's never just wine. It's never just some guy saying something. There has to be the Holy Spirit in operation there, the promise of God in, in connection with these things. But when the promise of God comes, when the Holy Spirit operates, He always operates using the created things. And we receive them by using created things. If you don't have ears, you can't hear. If you don't have eyes, you can't read. If you don't have fingers, you can't do the, what, what you call it, braille? Yeah, well, yeah. Probably you have other parts of body you can use. But you know, if you don't have body, you can't receive the word of God. That's basically, you know, if you go, come down to it. You have to have body in order that you can receive the word of God. You have to have mind. You have to have soul, which are also created by God in order to receive any of his gifts. God uses your cre created gifts to give you, you have to have mouth to drink his blood and eat his body. And, and that's how salvation comes to us. God is constantly using creation to us. Okay. 
I shall finish in that thought uh, that this gives great value to creation. And now, perhaps it's time for us, for you, to ask or comment uh, on something you heard, or if you want to make an application of how does this work in our spiritual life. You would be very welcome to do that as well.